Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to this special day of worship here at First Presbyterian Church in beautiful Columbus, Georgia. We are glad that you're here. I would like to ask that you go ahead and fill out those red friendship pads on the end of the rows. And as you do that, let's take a quick second and welcome those that are near to us this morning.
few announcements to get us started. Um, again, if you are a visitor, there's one thing I'll give you a heads up on, and that is if you look a few of the categories down on the first page, we have the unison call to worship. That is the one time I know everybody has to open their Bible and find it because we don't print it in the bulletin. So today it's Psalm 117. So you can go ahead and get that ready, both members and visitors alike. And Danny uh, Mosley will lead you in just a moment. Uh, July 8th is a congregational meeting uh, during the service where we will uh, approve the slate uh, that the nominating committee um, has worked so hard to put together through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your thoughtful nominations and choices. And I'm thankful to Scott Bryan and the nominating committee for their fantastic work. Uh, it's not an easy job and they did it uh, with persistence and grace. So thank you. Um, I'm excited about this incoming class. Um, and also, you'll notice we have communion today. Uh, if you are a visitor, you are welcome to come and, and join us at the table. Uh, for us, it is not uh, transubstantiation, meaning it's not the literal body and blood of Christ. It is the symbolic body and blood of Christ. It is bread and it is grape juice. And all those that trust in Christ are welcome to his table. So you don't need to be from this church or from this city. Um, so we welcome you to come and join us. I would now like to call uh, for our session report today, Sally Haddon. Come on down, Sally. Good morning. I'm delighted to bring news from our session. We have an active role membership of 425. Um, as Reverend Danny just mentioned, we approved a congregational meeting for July 8th, next Sunday, for the election of our new slate of officers. Always a very exciting time in the life of our church. We approved a dinner theater production in November to be presented by our drama ministry led by Lisa K. Matchin. We approved the church hosting a church security and intruder response training here at our church, August 17th through 18th. We, re we ratified the fill of our pulpit during June by Reverend Earl Nichols of the Pastoral Institute. We identified our financial secretary, Suzanne McCary, as authorized to direct sale transactions for any securities through Sonova Securities, should we need that to happen. We received reports on our presbytery meeting on June 9th in Donaldsonville, the Montreat Youth Conference, and Vacation Bible School, and we ended with prayers for our congregation. Thank you. Please join me in the unison call to worship by turning to Psalm 117 in your pew Bibles. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord.
Please be seated. We come to this time of confession because it is what Christ came to do, and that is to reconcile God and humanity. We know we have all fallen short. We know none of us are exactly who God created us to be, that each of us has made decisions both consciously and unconsciously that have separated us from God, from each other, and even from ourselves. But it is not God's desire that we would wallow in our guilt, in our shame, but rather that we would be freed, freed from sin and given new life in Christ when we turn back and repent to God. Therefore, with open hearts and minds, let us come before his throne of grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Lord of light and liberty, you have set a savior in our world, country and hearts. Forgive us when we give ourselves to the idols of this world and not to Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us as we have neglected those in need, obsess over ourselves and live as we do not know you. In the name of Jesus Christ, wash us clean and grant us new lives of courage and faith. Friends, the great news on this July 1st is better than great. It is amazing and it is overwhelming. And that is that God loved us so much, despite our rebellious and sinful nature, that God sent Christ for you, for me, for this world, for all time. It is, there is only one who is worthy to judge us and it is Christ himself. And he gave himself on the cross And on that first Easter was raised, having overcome the powers of sin and death. Therefore, in the name of the risen Christ, I declare that our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. great. We're having to squinch in a little bit, which is kind of cool. You guys can sit anywhere you want, anywhere you want. Well, as you know, this is a special week, right? We've got a special holiday on Wednesday, July 4th. We celebrate Independence Day. And as y'all know, Miss Deb has a habit of doing something kind of special when we have a holiday. So what do you think might be waiting for us upstairs? It is 4th of July. What do you think might be waiting for us? What's my typical thing? What? Go ahead, Connor. What do, we, what do I buy you guys when it's a special time? A snack. A snack. That's right. What kind of snack do I usually get? 
Well, we might do that too, but you guys know that I like to go drive through Dunkin' Donuts and get you guys some donuts. So I did that this morning. Now, who doesn't love donuts, right? Yeah, see, I do. But let me tell you guys, I bet you if I were to give you the opportunity, you could all tell me what your favorite donut is, right? You all have a favorite, don't you? How about on the count of three, we just say it. Don't shout it, just say it. Are you ready? You can just say it so you can all tell me. One, two, three. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> okay, okay, I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. Preston says he'd never met a donut he doesn't like. I agree with you, Preston. Okay, so, well, who doesn't? Donuts are fabulous, aren't they? But which brings me to my point. Okay, we all have different opinions, don't we? Some of us like chocolate, some of us like blueberry. There's all kinds of great, great things. I do too, I do too. Okay, okay. It's kind of the same way with, with other big things too, right? We all like different things and we all have different opinions. And it's okay that maybe Barry likes chocolate and maybe Thomas likes a different flavor and Liza likes a different flavor. That's okay. We don't have to all like the same thing and we don't have to all think the same way. In our country and in this world, God made so many cool people of all different shapes and sizes and colors and we're to love them all, aren't we? That's what we're called to do. Now, sometimes we disagree with each other. Kind of, we'll get you in a minute. Sometimes we disagree with each other and sometimes we disagree with each other and it might sometimes get a little bit angry. Have you ever had that happen? Where somebody says, no, my opinion's the right opinion. And you say, no, my opinion's the right opinion. Here's the thing. You know what you believe. You know what you feel. Stand true to that. You don't have to waver from that. But when somebody shares something else that's of a different mind, be kind, be receptive. Even if you don't agree with what they're saying, listen. That's something we're losing the ability to do is listen to each other. It's very important because God calls us to love each other. First thing he says, love him. Second thing he says, love each other. Two things, pretty easy, right? So remember those two things because when we love God and we act like God, we're loving others. So if somebody says something that might be a little bit different than the way you feel, well, listen, be kind and be receptive to that. What's the craft? You're just gonna have to wait and see, Miss Girl. All right, well, let's bow our heads, shall we? And you guys pray with me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for creating our beautiful world. Thank you for our freedom to love you and to love one another. In Christ's name, amen. Great job, guys. Let's go get some donuts. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence us in any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And it shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship the God, you worship God on this mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you. Our second lesson is taken from 1 Peter. We are in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. How should we then interact with the government, with our leadership? Listen. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors, as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And moving on to Galatians. Galatians 5, verses 13 through 15. Again, what is this freedom business about? For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today, we celebrate 4th of July. It's right in the middle of the week this week on Wednesday, so we could go either way, before or after. We thought we'd go ahead and do it on this end. A lot of our folks are traveling already, take advantage of the time off. But what a great celebration for our nation. Fourth of July is always one of my favorites. We used to gather every summer in Montreat, North Carolina. The meal would be grilled hot dogs, Fritos, chili, Mom's uh, jalapeno cheese grits and a variety of other options. Cornbread, for which I have the skillet. It was a special time. Invite family and friends. A great day to celebrate our love for one another and this nation. The word freedom is a word that we have come to rely on, that we have come to understand is at the foundation of who we are, both as a people of faith and as a nation. And it's this word that I want to briefly focus on this morning. I think we've done an injustice to the word freedom. It seems to be thrown about very easily, and we can mean so many different things. The word free also in conjunction with things that we buy or things that they want you to buy. My favorite are now the infomercials that are selling you one thing and then right at the end they'll say, but wait, there's more. They've always done that. But then there's a new piece. We will send you a second thing that you don't need. Just pay a separate fee. What? A second item for free, just pay a separate fee. What? It doesn't say just additional shipping. It says you pay a separate fee for the thing that they just told you you were getting for free. Maddening. Maddening. And we come to see free as just a word about money and finances, consumer exchange, and materialism. But it is a fantastic word of faith. It is something that Paul talks about regularly. This Galatians passage is just one of those places. So Paul's letter to the churches, the clusters in Galatia, has to do with this understanding of freedom. What are they wrestling with? Why did Paul write to them? Because they are having a hard time figuring out how to be Christians. I'm glad they took care of that long ago. They're infighting in the churches over theology, 
how to do things as a congregation. Again, I'm glad they worked that out then. Specifically, Paul had founded these churches, and then he moved on. And then there were some Christian missionaries that came in that started stirring the pot a little bit to say that, well, before you can become a full Christian, you have to go back and go through the Jewish law. You have to be circumcised. You have to do everything that the Torah says to become a full Christian that they did for the Jews at that time. That's where the struggle has come at this particular time. Do they need to be circumcised to be Christian? And Paul says, no. And these missionaries that came in after he established the churches say, well, yes, of course he does. And so again, all meaning well, but divisions and factions coming about. The churches, again, are at a place of conflict and friction. And so Paul feels the need to try to clarify and to get some understanding of how to move forward together. So Paul, we know, used to be a Pharisee, right? Who were they? Kind of keepers of the law. They were kind of Jewish lay people and their job was to interpret the law, make sure everything is in line with the way that God laid it out in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books, the Torah. But Jesus was all over them in the New Testament. Why? Because they had become so rigid about the laws that they forgot that the laws were there to stimulate a relationship with God. And so Jesus got on them and said, you are hypocrites. You say do this, but then you don't do that. Your heart is not pure. You're not even trying to foster this relationship. You're just trying to improve your self-standing, making sure that you have job security by continuing to enforce these laws that are important. But Paul brings in this whole other conversation about the spirit, spirit versus the law. And the word freedom when we think about that in a national sense, it, goes, it takes me right back to 4th of July, around the events that surrounded the birth of this nation. And it is something we can and should be proud of. Wednesday night, we looked at several of the founding fathers and looked at quotes that they had that were professing different ways that they understood their Christian faith. So yes, I believe God was active in the founding of this nation and many of the principles are Judeo-Christian. But one of those principles was that all can worship and all can speak. And our tolerance should be different than those factions from other places that chased us out of every decent country in the world. So we had to found our own. Freedom. What does that mean? Well, the literal definition is that we can live unencumbered by any external forces. We can really do what we want. Is that the freedom that we are seeking? In Galatians also is where you have the fruits of the Spirit. That comes a few verses later. Right before the fruits of the Spirit, you have this list that Paul puts out of all the things that challenge us as human beings. He calls it, lumps it all into the category of flesh. Now that's not just sexuality or morality or immorality as it pertains to the body. It is a way that Paul lumps all of that together. Jealousy, anger, drunkenness, all, all these other things, Paul just kind of catches all into that word flesh. And so he lists them all out and then says, as an antidote, how do we do it then? Well, we have the fruits of the Spirit. We have these gifts from God, joy, peace, self-control. That may be the biggest and the hardest, self-control. Liberty and freedom are very similar in their definition. The definition of liberty expressly laid out being free from opposing forces in your life that would, I'm paraphrasing now, weigh you down and affect your behavior. 
We are liberated from those things. We are free from those things. So both Christ and our country, we are seeking freedom. But often it's not, as I heard one preacher say, it's not a freedom from as much anymore as it should be a freedom to. What are we free from? And we are very quick to stand up and say what we would like to be free from, but what are we free to do? And in this passage that I read to you, Paul says it very clearly. Freedom comes in our love for one another. Treat your neighbor like yourself. We know that, right? If there's anything we know about the Bible, it is that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's not a Jesus saying. First time in the Bible, Leviticus. Leviticus. That book that we fight over so much that gives all those specific laws. You can't eat shellfish, your beard has to be trimmed just right. You can't wear the blended fabrics and you have to do this and you have to do that. In Leviticus 19, 18, the first place, it says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting Leviticus when he says it. And on this lies our freedom. Well, how, is, how does that work? Christ came to set you free in the big picture from the two biggies, sin and death. Therefore, we shouldn't fear. The end of this life is not the end. It is our transition. It is a beginning. We are in a temporary bus stop here on our way home. Christ made that possible. And in this life, to be able to be forgiven, gosh, what a gift. To be free of that mess that we carry around. Sometimes we believe that we're forgiven. Sometimes we don't allow ourselves that freedom. But that's why Christ came, one of the reasons. So that we could be free to enjoy this life, to turn back to God and forgiveness and repentance come together. You should be working on those things you're asking forgiveness for. Otherwise, we're, we're just lobbing up that we're sorry and then we continue the same practices and behaviors of which God loves us and welcomes us either way. So God takes care of those. We can always come home through Christ to God no matter who we are, what we've done, where we've been, or even where we're going. And then death is not something that we need to fear. I know it's uncertain and you have to die of something. That's not pleasant to look forward to. Nobody wants to go, nor should we. Life is a gift. And that's what this freedom is all about. So what about these laws then? How do we, does Paul throw out all the laws? No. And what he's saying, I think clearly, is that being enslaved to Christ is where our freedom lies. Just think about that for a second. Being enslaved to Christ is where our freedom lies. And that means that when we fully give ourselves to God, fully are all in seeking to follow Christ, we have these set of parameters that God has given us through Old and New Testament whether it's Ten Commandments, whether it's the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, all of those things that we know as Christians we are supposed to be operating within. Those are our parameters, but we have that freedom that comes from within. Often we see those things or we only see it halfway. I have to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> Got to read the Bible. I don't want to do that. <laughs> And make me go to youth group or Sunday school or men's breakfast. Or we can see those as opportunities 
to enjoy our lives that we have been given. We can look at the laws as a collection of restrictions or those things that allow us freedom within those laws. Think about our country. We stand on freedom. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm an American. Do what I want to do. Well, your country can and does tell you what to do at different times and places. You have to do certain things to live in this country and not be arrested. You'd have a driver's license if you drive. You need to ideally pay taxes. That's a part of what we do. But then there's a whole set of laws that we've agreed to obey. Maybe you push that speed limit a little bit. Maybe you cross the street when it's not green. But largely, the laws of this nation are what make this nation great. Because we all decide and agree to, for the most part, obey them. And then when people don't, we react to that. Justice comes in and takes over at that point, our criminal justice system. But it's similar. What gives us the freedom to believe that this is one of the best nations in the world? It is working within the guidelines of our constitutional framework. The laws, our representational government, our military that protects us and keeps us safe, our first responders that come when sometimes those laws are violated, that gives us a great sense of freedom. And that is to be celebrated. And with Christ, it's in a similar fashion. Those things are laid out around us for our freedom in Christ. And it is not just for ourselves. Freedom in this nation is not just for ourselves. And freedom in Christ is not just for ourselves. I'd like to read a poem by George Matheson. It's called, Make Me a Captive, from 1890. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conqueror be. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me with thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. Imprison me with thine arms, God, and then I will be stronger. So again, it's that sense that within Christ we are free, although we like to think that nobody telling us what to do is how we are free. And yet we live within our country's framework. Today we celebrate the Declaration of Independence. Hear how it ends. The very last paragraph. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, providence, the word provide is in it, it just means God giving us what we need. With the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So the very document that begins to set us free as a nation, the very last paragraph, all reliant on God being present in God's foundation, and then says it's not about us as individuals. We mutually pledge to one another our lives, to one another, not enjoying the freedom to take home and sit although sometimes we need to do that. We mutually pledge our lives to one another, our lives, our fortunes. I'm not giving you a dollar, buddy. Are you kidding me? Pledge to one another, our fortunes, and then our sacred honor to one another as those who live in this United States community. Freedom is not just for us as individuals, it is very clear through their own words that we are ingrained with one another. And so we rise or fall together. 
Our sacred honor, not just our honor, our sacred honor. What makes it sacred? Christ. So today as we celebrate our freedom, we do so knowing that we have parameters that set us free. With our faith, it is the guidelines that God has laid out through Christ and how we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in a similar way in our nation, those divinely inspired laws and documents that have been such a strong foundation, along with other pieces and parts, not the least of those are the military, that provide for us a foundation of safety and freedom. But again, a freedom that is connected and tied to one another. So my challenge to you today is that on Wednesday, on the 4th of July, to fully live into the freedom of this nation and into Christ, go and serve someone with whom we are pledged through this document, with whom we are pledged through our Savior. And then that freedom we can fully celebrate not just for ourselves, but for those in our families, our communities, and the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us stand together and affirm what it is we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and is Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and sent into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and set up on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How then do we say thank you to a God who has given us this gift of freedom through Christ? Let us begin as we collect our tithes and offerings.
We offer our gift to you, Lord, with grateful, cheerful hearts. Thank you that you meet our needs on the journey, providing what we need when we need it. Trusting you, we can share what we have with others. And we do this joyfully together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It is a, a joy and a privilege to be called to this table. In our Presbyterian tradition, we have two sacraments, baptism and communion. And our simple criteria is that Christ both did those and commanded us to go and do them as well. So in a minute or two, I'll take the bread and say, as he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Same with the cup and in baptism, at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, he said to go out and baptize the world in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so those are our two sacraments. It is a time where we come together to be intentionally in Christ's presence. To be at the table with all the believers of all time, those who have gone ahead of us, and then the, the word communion also is the same word as in community. So have we, have we have talked about the importance of how interconnected we are in our lives through our faith, through this freedom that we seek. It is at this table that we can come together. So Christ has set this table for you, for me, and for the world. All who trust in him are welcome to come and partake of this feast. Please join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving that will end with the Lord's prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord God, it is not just right, it is a part of who we are. As we seek to follow you as your people in a variety of ways and places through different people, that you have created all differently. What a joy it is to be able to come here to your table. This is a table of thanksgiving and remembrance. So we go back to the very beginning of creation and we as humans as a part of it and we give you thanks. We see throughout the whole Old Testament that you sought to bring us back to you after that original sin after our rebellious nature continued. You sent us priests and prophets and kings and military leaders and judges, all to bring us your word and bring us home to you. Finally, you decided that the burnt offering system, it was time to change and you gave us the last offering and sacrifice necessary in Jesus Christ. We remember how he was born into the world that we celebrate at Christmas in such a miraculous way. The shepherds and the angels were present. The other animals and the wise men came later, all to testify that this in fact did happen and that the world was about to change. We remember how Christ grew in wisdom and stature, how he taught in the synagogues, how he shared and told stories, how he healed, how he prayed, how he sought to reach out and bring us back to you. But it was much more difficult than that. We remember how he gave himself knowing what he would have to do to feel the full emotional and physical pain of the cross. How his friends had betrayed him and left him. How he felt alone on that cross and how he died there that we may have the opportunity to come home as your children. But that wasn't the end, Lord, for that first Easter, the world changed forever that day. For Christ emerged 
three days later, having overcome the power of sin and death for humanity for all time. And we give you thanks and we remember it all. You sent your gift of the Holy Spirit to be with us at Pentecost, and it is that which remains with us today and every day. So as we come to your table, help us to feel your presence through this symbolic feast and celebration. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, this daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was on that first night that Christ gathered with his disciples that he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the common cup that was before him and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So every time that we eat from this bread and drink from this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death, the saving death of Christ till he comes again. These are the gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. Hallelujah. Servers, please. Um, this is a method, as they come forward, we will be observing the method called intinction. That is the way that you come forward you take your stand to come and claim this sacrament with Christ. There will be stations. Uh, we encourage you to come. Uh, you will be released to the station that is close to you. Take the bread already cut for you, dip it in the juice, eat it, and then you can return to your seat for some reflection and prayer time. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good.
Does anyone yet need to be served? The world is hungry for this meal. Let us take it to them. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this feast. The way that once again, through this bread and this juice, you are again inside of us physically and spiritually. Let us start again with the new life that you have given us through Christ. Lord, we take this time to say thank you for all the blessings in our lives. We thank you for this nation and would ask that you help us return to the values, to your love, to the freedom that you mean for us and it. We thank you for those who gave their lives, founding it, who have protected it, who protect it, and who will protect it and keep it safe. But not just for this nation, but for the world. Lord, we ask that your grace would continue to wash over us, that we would continue to be your people. And in that way, bring the whole world to freedom in Christ. For we are inextricably woven together with all of your children, wherever they may be. Lord, be with those who suffer today in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for the leaders of this and every nation that they would hear your voice. Your spirit is working in ways that we can and we cannot see, but we trust you and put our lives and faith, nation and world in your hands from whence it came. Give us the courage to trust, to use our freedom, not just to catalog what we are free from, but to use that freedom to go and to love and serve others in your name. For it is in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Our last hymn is hymn number 510, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies.
And now go out into this beautiful day and know that you have been called to be a bearer of God's light. Submit yourself to Christ and in the midst of that, we will be free. And use that freedom to care for one another in the name of Jesus Christ, for whom we live, breathe, and have our being. And now may God's Holy Spirit fill your heart, fill your soul, transform you from the inside out, give you the gifts of courage, grace, and love and compassion to go out into the world, to let them know that Christ has been raised. Hallelujah. Amen.